Perfectly fine to bring those things to God as a sacrifice. If you're a farmer, you tithe on that produce the same as the rancher or the shepherd does from his flocks. So that, that can't be it. A third theory says that this just follows the motif that's common in Scripture of God favoring the younger over the older. You'll remember Jacob over Esau. Well, this is Abel over Cain. Abel's the younger, and God favors him just like he, he favored Jacob over Esau, or, or David, the youngest, the, the runt of the litter over all of his older brothers. Well, if that's true, the Bible never points to that as being the explanation. And there doesn't seem to be any other special favor given to Abel because he was younger. I really don't think that's it. Most scholars believe that the key to understanding what's wrong with Cain's sacrifice and what's right with Abel's sacrifice is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Hebrews 11, 4 reads, By faith... Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous person when God spoke well of his offerings. According to the writer of Hebrews, it's Abel's faith, his heart, that makes the difference. Think about it. Cain brings some of the produce of his field. But Abel brings fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. How do you get a fat portion? You have to kill the animal. And this is a firstborn. This is what you've waited. This is why you put mom and dad together in the stall there a while back. You've been waiting for that firstborn, and now in order to get that fat portion from the firstborn, you have killed the firstborn. What that means is you have delayed your own gratification as a way of saying, God, you come first. And not only have you delayed your gratification, but you have shown your faith. Because you're trusting when you kill the firstborn that there's going to be a secondborn. If not, your career as a shepherd or a rancher is going to be real short. So Abel, by faith, gives God a better sacrifice. He shows his dependence on God for the future, and he says, Lord, you come first. You're more, you're more important than I am. Cain, he brings some of the produce of his field. And scholars point to that word, some. You got some potatoes laying over there, and some of them are pretty scrawny. They don't amount to much. Some people give them to God. I remember hearing years ago, Butterball had a hotline. And somebody called the Butterball hotline one day and they said, if I had a turkey in the freezer for a year, is it still okay? And the person on the butterball end of things said, well, it might be a little bit freezer burn. You might notice that the meat's a little bit tougher, but as long as it's been solidly frozen for the last year, it won't hurt anything. It won't make you sick. It just won't be as, as good as you might wish it was. And the person who made the call said, oh, that's okay. I was just going to give it to the church so they could give it away for Thanksgiving anyway. Some versus fat portions from the firstborn of the flock. Cain didn't want to put God first. Cain didn't have his heart in the right place. One scholar notes that while 
Eve had to be talked into sin in chapter 3. God tries to talk Cain out of sin in chapter 4. Cain, if you do the right thing, you'll be accepted. You can enjoy the same favor that Abel is enjoying. Cain, you better be careful. Sin's crouching at your door. It desires to have you. But even with that warning from God himself, Cain will not be dissuaded. His heart is not devoted to God. And so this is the first story from Scripture that proves it's the thought that counts. It's a matter of what's in your heart. Let me see if I can help you understand that. Gentlemen, Valentine's Day is now just a little over a month away. And I've got some suggested gifts for you. I think you should buy your wife the Go Vacuum model G62711. This baby is, it has a 10 amp motor, a HEPA filter with a 99.97 filtration rate. It's got a 14 inch cleaning path. It only weighs 15.5 pounds and it is covered in 24 karat solid gold. Nothing but the best for you, baby. The Go Vacuum G62711 is only going to set you back $1.1 million. But you can show your love for your wife by getting her that vacuum. Brenda's shaking her head now. So, Jerry, I'm going to make it a little easier on you. She doesn't want the 24 karat G62711 Go Vacuum. What you should buy her is the Dyson Outsize Absolute. It retails for $969, so you got it. She's already shaking her head now. <laughs> What's the problem? A woman might want gold for Valentine's Day, but it's not in a gold plated vacuum cleaner. Okay? If you give your wife a vacuum cleaner for Valentine's Day, you're not going to live to see the next Valentine's Day. Okay? Your heart is not in the right place. Your thought is what counts. And she doesn't like your thinking. Well, God looks at it the same way. It's not how much you can give. It's where's your heart? And Abel's heart demonstrates his faith, his trust that God has control of his future. And it demonstrates his priorities. God, you come first. I'll delay my gratification so that you can have the offering that I want to give you. Bob Russell told about seeing a, a, a bumper sticker that read, Tithe, if you love Jesus, anybody can honk. Are we going to put God first? Are we going to show him our heart by the way we give to him? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you want to know what's important to somebody, just look at their checkbook. Look at their bank statement. Look at what they spend their money on because Jesus was right. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Or maybe what we should say is you're going to put your treasure where your heart is. If your treasure is long life, if you want to have a long and healthy life on this earth, chances are you're going to spend a little bit more on food. You're not going to buy that box stuff that everybody knows is bad for you. You're going to buy the fresh stuff, and you're going to cook, and you're going to try to eat right because you know what you put in your body is going to have an, a difference over time. And if you want to live a good long life, you're probably going to consult with the doctor pretty regularly. You're going to want to make sure that you've got the best medical care possible. And if something does happen to go wrong, you're going to want to intervene before it gets too bad. Well, that's going to cost you money. Doctors don't come cheap. 
where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Or more correctly, because your heart is in your physical health, we'll be able to tell it because that's how you'll spend your money. Some people's heart is really given over to sports. So they've got subscriptions to all the sports channels. They've got season tickets. They love to party and have tailgates. They spend a lot of money on bringing their friends over. Their heart is in the sports. They make donations to the athletic boosters of unconscionable amounts that the rest of us can only dream of. But they don't mind that sacrifice because it tells what's important to them. They love sports. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For some people, they're smart enough to figure out, you know, ain't any point in living a long time if you can't have people around you that love you. And so they treasure relationships. That's why that kid in college who can't hardly afford the money to put a dollar and a quarter in the pop machine and get a Coke, that's why he'll save and save and save so that he can put that $2,000 ring on her finger, give her a piece of the rock. He wants her to know she's important to him. And, and some of you are parents. Maybe you're paying for a private education. You make sure your kids have designer clothing. You take child-centered vacations. This year we're going to Disney World. You, you put a lot of money into your kids because you value those kids. Your treasure is going where your heart is. Your thoughts are with your family and you want them to know that you love them. And so you express that with your giving. Well, it works that way with our giving to God, too. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, a group of people who are very proud of their spiritual heritage. They think they are really solid Christians. And so Paul challenges them. He says, since you excel in everything in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love that we've kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. I want to see how much you love by looking at your gift, because where your treasure is demonstrates where your heart is. Back in 1840s, a guy named John Hyler started a chocolate shop in New York City. And he was pretty good at making chocolate. I can tell you that he had one of his employees, a guy who worked for him, learned some of his secrets. He left New York City, moved down to Pennsylvania, and he started Another business, you've probably heard of it, it's called Hershey's. John Hyler had the original recipe. And John Hyler had that chocolate shop in New York City, and it was popular. People loved his product. Pretty soon he was able to start chocolate shops in several other major cities around this country. He was making a hefty profit. But from the very beginning... John Hyler created a special account with his bank that he labeled the MP account. MP stands for my partner. You see, John Hyler was a godly man and he took Jacob's pledge. Jacob's pledge is found in Genesis 28, 22. Lord, if you'll bless me of all that you give me, I'll give you a tenth. And so... 10% of John Hyler's profits were put in the MP account for his partner, God. And then he distributed out of that account to different Christian ministries and missions and so forth. And he would always ask whenever he sent a check that there would not be any recognition of him. He wanted to give anonymously. He said, 
Just give the glory to God. His treasure was going to reflect the location of his heart. We Christians, we Christians kind of lament the direction that our world is going right now. But I wonder if some of it isn't our fault. Maybe it's because our hearts are not quite as devoted to God as they need to be. Sylvia and John Ronsvale from the Lilly Foundation have been examining giving and giving patterns over the last 50 or 60 years. They started by studying a period of time from 1968 to 1985, and they found that during that period of time, after-tax income raised 31%, but giving actually decreased 8.5%. And it's continued to fall since 1985. Researchers have now discovered that from 1968 until now, the average charitable contribution has decreased from 3.11% of income down to 2.2% of income. In fact, at this moment in history, people are giving less as a percentage of their income than people did even during the Great Depression. What's that mean? Well, that means that we say we love God, but our treasures are not necessarily reflecting that truth. Sylvia Ronsvero concluded, people place a higher value on their lifestyles than they do the church. They have more money but they're spending more on themselves and less on the work of God. In fact, the prediction is that at the current rate of decline, by the year 2050, Americans will give less than 1% of their income to the church. Well, if our hearts are not in the right place, why should we be surprised that the hearts of the world are getting further and further from God. Maybe part of the problem is that the world is looking at those of us who wear the name of Christ and they're expecting us to actually act like Christians. And because we don't have our priorities in the right place, our thoughts are not what they ought to be. The world says, I don't think there's much to that. If they don't really believe it, why should I? And so it comes down to the Cain and Abel difference. Cain gave some, the least he could get by with. He wanted to be noticed by God. He wanted to have God's blessing. He needed to, to show that he acknowledged that there was a God, but, but he really wasn't going to sacrifice to give. But Abel... He demonstrated to God that God came first. Abel delayed his own gratification to make sure that God knew he was loved. And Abel displayed his faith. Fat portions from the firstborn believing that God was going to make sure there was a secondborn. So when God looks at you, does he see Abel? Or does he see Cain? If you're uncomfortable with your answer to that question, then let me give you the solution. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And while we can get an idea of where your treasure is by looking at your checkbook, the opposite is also true. If you put your treasure where you want your heart to be, your heart will follow. 
If you start investing in eternity, if you invest in the things of God, if you invest in the things that you know ought to be important to you, then you will find yourself growing closer and closer to God in the process. That's not my thought. That's the thought of the Apostle Paul. He writes these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Just give, Paul says, and you'll find that God can give back. He'll supply seed to the sower and bread for food. He'll take care of your needs. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Now, I need to be real careful about how I say this. Paul is not promising that if you give 10% to the church, God will give 90% back. Okay? It's not that you give to get. It doesn't work that way at least always on a physical level. Although, I've never seen anybody give their way into poverty. What Paul does promise is that if you give, God will give back. Sometimes that will be a physical blessing. He'll take care of your needs, seed for the sower and bread for food. But sometimes that will be a spiritual blessing. You will be closer to God. You will be more connected to the things of eternity. You'll have a greater peace in your heart because you'll know that things between you and your Creator are the way they ought to be. You'll have that sense of, of calm, that sense of peace, that sense of fulfillment that can only come because your heart is in God's hands. 25 years or so ago, I heard Bob Russell talk to the people of Southeast Christian Church about this, and, and he made it a challenge. He said to them, he'd heard about a church in Indiana that had actually offered to take God at his word. And so this church in Indiana said to their people, we believe that if you tithe, if you put God first, God will bless you. And so we're challenging you. For the next year, you put God first and you give 10% of your income. And if, at the end of that year, you do not feel like you have been blessed, if you don't think that you've gotten closer to God, if you don't think that you have grown spiritually, if you don't think that God has provided for your needs, then a year from now, if you've tithed, you tell us, and if God has not kept his promises, we'll give the money back. And so Bob Russell, he said that to the people of Southeast Christian Church. He said, I like that. So I want to challenge you. For the next year, you tithe and God will bless you. I'm, I'm confident of that, but hey, you keep a record of your tithe. You, you give in such a way that you got some canceled checks and, and you can prove how much you gave. And, and if a year from now you don't feel like God has blessed you and you don't feel like God has met your needs and so forth, then there's a church in Indiana that will give you your money back. <laughs> and preachers steal from each other all the time, okay? It's sad, but... The truth is that people have been preaching God's word now for a couple thousand years and they've been doing it in every planet, every, every location on the planet. So, so my, my opportunity to be really original and to have a, a, a unique thought is pretty limited. Okay, preachers steal from each other. So I heard Bob Russell say that and I decided, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to my people about that. And I did it the way Bob Russell did it. And my elders came to me after the service and they said, that was cool, that was a good joke, but why did you back off? We'll back that up. The next time you say that, you tell people to try it. 
And if they don't feel like they've grown spiritually and they don't feel like God has met their needs and they don't feel like they have been blessed because they put God first, then we will give their money back. And so ever since, ever since when I've told that story, I've said it that way. And in 25 years, I've never had the opportunity to give anybody's money back. Nobody has ever come up and said, man, I'm disappointed. God didn't come through. Come through. He, he didn't keep his promise. And so when I was coming in this morning, I'm thinking, I'm going to challenge these people that way. And then I thought, no. No, because when you challenge people that way, that's depending on your faith. You're not asking them to show theirs. They have nothing to lose. They can't lose because even if they give the 10% and it doesn't work out, they can get right back. There's no faith on their part. You're just confident that if you make that promise, it'll be okay because nobody's ever asked for their money back. And so I guess if you want the promise, I'll give it to you. But what I'd rather do is to have you show your faith the way Abel showed his. He decided that God was the one who could control the future. And so he could give a firstborn believing that there's going to be a secondborn. And he decided to delay his own gratification because he wanted God to know, God, you're more important than I am. Here's my gift that shows my love for you. And so that's your challenge. To look at yourself and say, am I Cain or am I an Abel? And if you don't like the answer to that question, then you know what needs to change is your heart. We're going to close the service with an invitation hymn this morning. And for some of you, your heart is still caught in the trap of sin. You've never given Jesus your heart. You've never had the sin washed away. You've never had the Holy Spirit become part of you. We're going to give you the opportunity to make that choice, to get your heart in the right place in terms of eternity as we stand and sing this invitation hymn. If you're ready to give your life to Christ in baptism, then as we stand and sing, you come forward. Take time to be home.
Well, we're in a new year, so we got lots of things going on. Fellowship planning meeting today at 4. TD will be running that. If you'll enjoy the fellowship, you might want to go there and you can have a little input and maybe get something you like. But I like everything, so. <laughs> However, I have found that if you don't show up at a fellowship meeting, you might be involved in something you didn't plan on. So, <laughs> just, just word to the wise. Uh, family game night, January 14th, 5 to 8. There is a sign-up sheet so he knows how many pizzas to get. So I'm going to eat one all by myself, so if you want some, you better sign up. Okay, got a care meeting. This will be this Thursday at Angie Connett's house at 7. Also this Thursday at 7, there is a bylaws committee here at the church having a meeting. Um, notice down here we have a little paragraph. There is a whiteboard in the kitchen. Uh, if you notice that we are out of anything, running low on anything, hopefully running low, not out. That works better. Um, put it on that board so that the people who get that stuff can be made aware of it. They don't have to go opening all the cabinets and hopefully look before we run out. That way it'll help us to make sure we have coffee and creamer and all the utensils and stuff we use. Also, on the bulletin board in the back hallway is the sign-up sheet for the world-famous annual wild game feed up at Beverly. So, men, be sure and sign up. Uh, I can't remember who the guy was that's speaking. And I just printed it off this morning. Oh, well, I'm going anyhow. I go for the food. But anyways, so be sure and sign up. I have to send that in by the 20th of February, and of course it's happening once again on my wife's birthday, so she'll, she's on her own. <laughs> Any other announcements? Okay, uh, I didn't see any prayers back in the thingy, so let's go ahead and stand and we'll close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for another opportunity we've had to gather, and uh, Father, we thank you for all the faces we've seen here this morning, and uh, Father, we uh, ask that you would be with each of us this year. Help us, Father, to uh, take the challenge. Uh, I know many of us in this uh, auditorium have already done that many years ago, and <clears throat> Father, I can say that uh, it's truly been a blessing in my life, and I would encourage everybody to, uh, to tithe. Let their checkbook show where their heart is, that they, they are a part of your kingdom, and uh, your kingdom is the most important thing in their lives. We ask, Father, now that as we go our separate ways, that we truly would be a, an image of you, that we would be your ambassadors in this world. And, Father, that when people see us, they would want to have a part of what we have. Help us to love one another, Father, as your word tells us, that by that love they will understand that we are yours. Father, I'd ask now that you would keep us safe, that you would be with those who are on our prayer list. Uh, we know that there's those who have lost loved ones, those who are going through various cancers. Father, we ask that you would be with them. We know, Father, that you know best in each situation, that you know, Father, who are yours, and we know, Father, that uh, Sometimes when we go through these trials, it is a chance for us to grow closer to you, and I would ask that that would be the case. We ask, Father, once again that you would keep us safe and return us here at the next appointed time that we might worship you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.